Welcome back to History Class with Dr. W and our continuing study of 1968. In the last few lectures, we've begun taking a look at some of the international events of the year 1968, including such important milestones as the Prague Spring in Czechoslovakia and the protests that occurred in Paris and France in the spring and summer of 1968. In the lectures that follow, we're going to be looking at a number of other international protests in countries all around the world. Students and other listeners should keep in mind that what I'm sharing here is not intended to be a comprehensive look at these protests, and you're certainly welcome to do additional research on your own, but rather a quick look at a number of different protests in several different countries, and students should keep an eye out for overall themes and commonalities and maybe some comparison and contrast between all of these different protests. We'll start in this lecture by looking at some of the events in China. After years of internal conflict in China, Mao Zedong had finally secured control of the country in October 1949 when the Chinese Communist Party took over Beijing. After taking control, Mao pushed through a series of reforms establishing communist control. While many in the nation initially rejoiced, Mao's regime eventually became repressive. Mao followed the Stalinist model of rule, with no room for internal debate. He reigned supreme. Questions and challenges were forbidden. Mao was the supreme leader. The country largely supported Mao until some of his decisions led the nation off the rails. By far the most disastrous was the Great Leap Forward of 1957-59. to Mao planned to industrialize and reorganize the nation, and he told the Chinese people that a few years of suffering would eventually lead to unprecedented prosperity. He was wrong. Mao's instructions to industrialize and for Chinese peasants to abandon farming and instead to build steel smelting furnaces led to a massive famine causing millions of deaths. The Great Leap Forward led to a faction of political dissenters forming within Mao's government and around the country. Among those who questioned the policy was Liu Shaoqi, Mao's right-hand man and author of How to Be a Good Communist, second only to Mao's Little Red Book in popularity in the country. Liu and a number of other Chinese leaders attempted to revise the policy, restore peasant initiatives in agriculture, and stabilize the economy. While these efforts did have some marginal positive effects, Mao could tolerate no opposition. He began to work against Liu and the others in his faction. He claimed that Liu and the others were attempting to implant capitalism in the country, and he called for a sweeping cultural and political revolution to rid the nation of such traitors. This became the so-called Cultural Revolution, begun in May of 1966 and sweeping the nation for several years. Even if one accepted the initial premise of the Cultural Revolution, that a faction of traitors was importing capitalism in the country, it quickly became hijacked by zealous Mao followers who took the project in extreme directions. Soon, almost anyone in a position of established authority came to be questioned. The president of Beijing University was overthrown by a group led by Ni Wanzi, a philosophy professor who became one of the spokespersons of the movement. She said, let us unite and hold high the glorious red banner of Mao Zedong thought to resolutely, thoroughly, totally, and completely wipe out all monsters, demons, and counter-revolutionary revisionists of the Khrushchev type. Mao appealed to the youth of the nation to form a new zealous core of followers among university and school students. His team formed these young people into units known as Red Guards, and he called upon them to rid the country of the monsters and demons who attempted to take control. A billion copies of Mao's so-called Little Red Book, technically called The Thoughts of Chairman Mao, were distributed, and the Red Guards were allowed free access to China's railways and transportation. 
by the thousands, China's teenagers, their baby boomers, embraced the excitement of the moment and left their homes in the countryside and traveled the country in huge numbers. They attended enormous rallies in Beijing, some estimated at more than a million attending in Tiananmen Square, where Mao himself would address the crowd. Mao spurred them on, encouraging them to seek out and remove his, quote, enemies, which tragically took on whatever form the raging youth imagined. Almost any older person was at risk. Teachers, parents, and community leaders were beaten up and humiliated. Many of Mao's own close associates were removed, dragged out by the Red Guards, and paraded through the streets, often stripped down or forced to wear dunce hats. Many were tortured or even killed. The revolution waged war on traditional culture as well. Statues, buildings, works of art, tombstones, and books were ransacked, burned, and destroyed. The little red book was sacred to the Red Guards. Everything else was subject to attack and ruin. The situation became confusing and chaotic as Mao's supporters, who at times attempted to restore peace and order, themselves came under attack by the Red Guards, and by 1967 the warring factions bordered on civil war. By the spring of 1968, Mao's own People's Liberation Army was filled with division, and violence filled the streets all over the country. In the midst of so much confusion, the only safe position to take was absolute loyalty and fealty to Mao. The cult of personality was in full effect. Mao's former right-hand man, Liu Shaoqi, became public enemy number one and was placed under house arrest. While Mao relished in his re-established control for a time, he also worried that the situation was getting too chaotic and unpredictable. As the Red Guards roved the countryside unchecked, at times they challenged Mao himself. Mao also worried about the possibility of Soviet invasion after they invaded Czechoslovakia in the spring of 1968. Perhaps, seeing their neighbor and rival China in such turmoil, the Soviets would seize the opportunity to invade. The time had come to restore order. Mao ordered the People's Liberation Army to put an end to the clashes in the countryside. Through the summer and fall of 1968, there continued to be much violence as the conflicts were quelled, but there was more unity of purpose in the efforts. Mao's soldiers crushed any resistance. That fall, Mao closed the schools and ordered students to go work in the fields, effectively ending the Red Guards and putting the nation's young people to work. As the year drew to a close, the violence and chaos in China dwindled, and by the end of 1968, a completely tattered and exhausted Chinese nation cowered in fear and loyalty to Mao. As a final sign of the shift in power, at the 12th plenum of the Central Committee of the Chinese Communist Party in October, Liu Shaoqi was charged with being a traitor and sent to prison in Beijing. Within a year, after being subjected to horrible treatment in jail, Liu died of pneumonia in prison. Those who aligned with Liu during the chaotic years of the Cultural Revolution were also subject to such treatment. While the Cultural Revolution was horrific and left many Chinese scarred, it had not been a total purge. Most victims of the Red Guards were humiliated and bruised rather than murdered. Many of Mao's enemies survived, and while silenced for a time, they would eventually resurface, in some cases becoming leaders of the nation as it launched new reforms in the 1980s and beyond. In our next lecture, we'll look at the events in another nation in 1968, that of China's neighbor, Japan.